on World News Tonight. Attack backfires. Russia has a taste of their own medicine as a training exercise leads to chaos on home ground. Trust in trouble. The UK Premiership is hanging by a thread as Liz Trust crumbles to avert financial disaster. National unrest. Iran sees the death toll rise following lethal prison fires with the rest of the nation rallying against morality police. Marigold magic. Preparations for the Day of the Dead have beautiful blooms on display. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. And we start off tonight with updates on the Ukraine-Russia conflict. A Russian military plane crashed into a residential area of Yisk, a town in southwest Russia, near the border with Ukraine, causing a huge fire and killing at least 13 people. A towering inferno in the Russian city of Yisk. Five out of nine floors went up in flames. An apparent training exercise gone wrong. According to the Defence Ministry, the Su-34 warplane had taken off at the nearby Yuzhny Air Base, but an engine fire prevented the jet from gaining altitude. Both pilots successfully ejected. But the plane was carrying a bomb, which exploded on impact, meaning firefighters could not immediately reach the scene. Authorities confirmed that three of the victims died jumping from the upper floors to escape the blaze. The crash destroyed 17 flats, but the regional government has promised temporary accommodation and food to those affected in the 600-inhabitant building. Yeysk is a port town on the Sea of Azov, separated from occupied Russian territory in southern Ukraine by only 70 kilometres of sea, and is home to a Russian naval aviation training centre. Investigators were quick to the scene and are pursuing a criminal inquiry into what is the 10th reported non-combat crash of a Russian plane since the beginning of the war. And while Russia's military drills are going awry, NATO is also set to hold military drills simultaneously. Despite being separate from the Russian drills, the bloc claimed that they're not targeted towards Russia. NATO and Russia are set to hold long-planned separate training exercises of their nuclear forces at a time of huge tension as Moscow continues its war in Ukraine. NATO's annual training mission called Steadfast Noon begins today with warplanes that can drop atomic bombs flying over the UK, the North Sea and Belgium. The US and 13 other nations are participating in the NATO exercises, which have been conducted annually for over a decade. The Russian exercises, called Grom, which roughly translates into Thunder, are also conducted every year, normally in late October. It's an opportunity for Moscow to test its nuclear-capable bombers, submarines and missiles. But the Pentagon is accusing Moscow of being irresponsible for going ahead with the tests while at war with Ukraine. Both sides are expected to monitor each other closely. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Liz Truss is trying to rescue her premiership after the tax cut debacle caused a physical crisis and gave Labour a gargantuan polling lead over her Conservatives. But after what calamitous start, analysts doubt the Tory party will keep Truss in power for long, even if it means having two new Prime Ministers in the space of a few months. With political uncertainty hanging in the air, there was one main question on the minds of members of the British Parliament Monday evening, and an answer they didn't want to hear. And where is the Prime Minister? Yes, the PM is detained on urgent business. The Prime Minister should be here. There is a genuine reason, honourable members, why she is not here. The Prime Minister is cowering under her desk and asking for it all to go away. The Prime Minister is not uh, under a desk as the <laughs> Prime Minister. And when Liz Truss did finally arrive, it was not her but the brand new finance minister, Jeremy Hunt, who addressed lawmakers. This government will take the difficult decisions necessary to ensure there is trust and confidence in our national finances. That means decisions of eye-watering difficulty. Earlier in the day, Hunt announced he would reverse nearly all of the government's planned tax cuts, doing away with the Prime Minister's free market economic plan, which had sent the financial markets into a tailspin. 
Specifically, Hunt said the government would scrap a cut to the basic tax rate, which was at the center of Truss's plan, and that a massive state intervention to cap energy prices would end in April. It's a U-turn by Truss that has both opposition lawmakers and members of her own party calling on her to resign. How can Britain get the stability it needs when all the government offers is grotesque chaos? Yeah. The reversal from 10 Downing appears to have calmed the markets for now. But with just six weeks in office, even members of her own party are expressing doubts about how long trust can last. Police in the British city of Manchester are investigating the apparent assault of a Hong Kong pro-democracy protester demonstrating against President Xi Jinping, who can be seen on video footage being pulled into Chinese consulate grounds and beaten up. UK police are investigating the apparent assault of a Hong Kong pro-democracy protester who was pulled into Chinese consular grounds and beaten. The incident happened during a demonstration against Chinese President Xi Jinping on Sunday in the city of Manchester in northwest England. A man in a black cap and a ponytail can be seen being hauled by several men through a gate into Chinese consular grounds. The protester, known as Bob, is then kicked and punched by five men as he lies on the floor. Police at the scene eventually step in to free him. A Greater Manchester Police spokesperson told her inquiries were ongoing into the circumstances. They added that their officers responded immediately to defuse the situation. Speaking after the incident that was recently emigrated from Hong Kong, so the protest was peaceful. Britain's Foreign Office did not immediately respond to a request for comment. In a post on Twitter, Alicia Kearns, a Conservative Member of Parliament and Head of the Foreign Affairs Committee, has called on the Chinese ambassador to be summoned. The Chinese consulate in Manchester offered no immediate reply for comment. But at a news conference in Beijing, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin told reporters he wasn't aware of the situation. He added the Chinese embassy and consulate in the UK always abide by the laws of their host country. A friend of the man involved, who was also at the scene, said Bob had been left with cuts and bruises to his face and went to hospital for treatment. Protesters with banners had been outside the consulate during the first day of the Communist Party Congress. It is widely expected that Xi will be granted a third five-year leadership term during the twice-decade event. France braced for nationwide transport strike actions as the government and unions remained in deadlock over stoppages at oil depots that have sparked fuel shortages. After weeks of strike action at fuel refineries, France's social unrest is spilling over into other sectors. Tuesday's nationwide strike threatens to cripple public transport in particular. France's rail operator, the SNCF, says up to half of trains could be cancelled. I'll get by. I'll ask my girlfriend or a neighbour to give me a lift. It doesn't matter. They're right to do what they're doing. I'm not sure it's useful to bother people who rely on public transport. Suburban rail services in the Paris region, as well as buses, will also face disruption, but the metro won't be too affected. Teachers and hospital staff may also walk off the job, leaving some parents scrambling to make contingency plans. I thought only public transport would be affected. Luckily we're working from home so we can pick him up at midday if we need to. The cost of living is going up, but not everyone can have a 20% pay rise. The leftist unions behind the calls to strike, such as the CGT, have called for higher salaries to help workers feeling the squeeze from the cost of living crisis. Workers have also voted to extend industrial action at fuel refineries and depots, defying the government, which is forcing staff back to work after three weeks. This is a breach of the right to strike, which is constitutional once again, and we must, we will, and we will continue to hammer it home. French President Emmanuel Macron says he wants a solution to the fuel crisis as soon as possible. But with industrial action spreading, his government is now battling to avoid a winter of discontent. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news.
Welcome back to World News Tonight. The official death toll in a fire that raged through Tehran's Evin prison was doubled to eight. And that figure could still go up. The blaze has further stoked tensions after a month of protests sparked by the death of Masa Amini. Iran's infamous Evin prison, a towering inferno, massive flames lighting up the night sky in Tehran. The sound of gunfire and explosions constant this weekend, saying the fire began after a fight between prisoners. There's been no independent confirmation. Iranian-American dual national Siam Namazi has been held in Evin for the last seven years, charged with being a spy. Charges the U.S. say are false. His lawyer saying he was safe and had spoken to his family. Protests in Iran have been raging for five weeks, sparked by the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini. She was arrested by the morality police for violating the dress code and died in custody three days later. Young Iranians with women and girls at the helm protesting the requirement to cover their hair have been clashing with police, some of those arrested being taken to Evin prison. China delayed the release of economic indicators scheduled for publications this week, including its third quarter gross domestic product data. The highly unusual delay comes amid the week-long Congress of the ruling Communist Party. China has delayed releasing its third quarter GDP figures and other key economic indicators. They were scheduled for release Tuesday morning. It's a highly unusual move and comes as Beijing plays host to the week-long Communist Party Congress, during which President Xi Jinping is expected to secure an unprecedented third term in office. The data for third quarter GDP has been highly anticipated. GDP was expected to have expanded 3.4 percent in July to September year-on-year. -year. That's after China's economy grew just 0.4 percent in the second quarter from a year earlier. The weak growth has been in part down to stringent COVID curbs and a deepening property slump. The National Bureau of Statistics website didn't specify when the figures will be released. Also postponed September's releases for a host of other figures, including industrial production, retail sales and the urban jobless rate, as well as data for China's home prices last month. The United States and Mexico said that they are preparing a UN resolution that would uh, authorize an international mission to help improve security in Haiti, whose government issued a distress call for the people of the crisis-wracked nation. Violence between police and protesters came to a head in Porto Pass, as anger in crisis-ridden Haiti continues to boil over. Thousands took to the streets to demand the resignation of Prime Minister Ariel Henry, as famine, lawlessness and fuel shortages hammer the country. At an emergency UN Security Council meeting on Monday, the country's foreign affairs minister appealed to the council for help. Unfortunate and regrettable events are taking place every day. Human lives are lost. There are kidnappings, public and private properties destroyed, rapes, theft, looting, threats and intimidation. And this plunges the country further into chaos, as now we also have the resurgence of cholera. This comes as the U.S. and Mexico announced their efforts to prepare a multinational force to help improve security and break the grip that gangs have over fuel distribution. The first resolution would impose financial sanctions on criminal actors that are inflicting so much suffering on the Haitian people. It is time to hold them accountable for their actions. The second resolution we're working on would authorize a non-UN international security assistance mission to help improve the security situation and enable the flow of desperately needed humanitarian aid. The gang's blockade has left more than 10 million gallons of fuel inaccessible, leaving petrol stations closed and hospitals and businesses on their knees as residents struggle without fuel. Haiti has been racked by instability since the still unresolved assassination of President Jovenel Moise last year, and further gripped by surging inflation and protests that have brought the country to its knees. The latest outbreak of Ebola in Uganda is to be battled by experimental vaccines developed by the Serum Institute. However, the trial drug is at risk of ineffectiveness due to the sheer number of cases. The Serum Institute of India plans to manufacture 20 to 30,000 doses of an experimental Ebola vaccine, its developers and a company source have said, to be deployed in trials against an outbreak in Uganda. 
The East African country has recorded 54 confirmed Ebola cases and 19 deaths since last month, though health authorities believe the actual numbers could be higher. The first case in the capital Kampala was reported last week. Uganda's response to the outbreak has been blunted by the lack of a proven vaccine against the Sudan strain of the virus. Vaccines against the more common Zaire strain have proven highly effective during recent outbreaks in neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. However, Oxford University's Jenner Institute, which developed a COVID-19 vaccine with AstraZeneca, has an Ebola vaccine that has been shown to induce an immune response in both the Zaire and Sudan strains in phase one trials. The developer said it could be deployed in Uganda for a clinical trial once authorities there give regulatory approval. Jenner Institute Chief Scientific Advisor Teresa Lam said Serum Institute could have manufactured the 20 to 30,000 doses by mid to end November. A Serum Institute source confirmed that information, adding that they would be supplied free of cost. In an interview on Saturday, Uganda's information minister said he did not have any information on a vaccine rollout, but that the outbreak was under control. On the same day, President Yoweri Museveni said the government would implement an overnight curfew and would, for 21 days, restrict movement in and out of two central Ugandan districts affected by Ebola. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The yen hit its lowest value against the US dollar in 32 years. Japan spent 2.8 trillion yen in dollar selling yen buying intervention last month when authorities intervened to drop up the yen for the first time since 1998. K-pop supergroup BTS has made it official that all seven members plan to go to the military to fulfill their mandatory services. Following their service commitment, BTS is expected to reconvene as a group again around 2025. South Korea's Hyundai Motors is considering a decision on its Russia operations that could include selling its manufacturing plant there. Many factories in Russia have suspended production because of sanctions and an exodus of Western manufacturers since Moscow sent armed forces into Ukraine. Chinese President Xi Jinping and his Ugandan counterpart Yuweri Museveni exchanged congratulations on the 60th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between the two countries. Two migrant laborers were killed when militants hurled a grenade at their home in Indian Kashmir shopping district. Kashmir is claimed in full but ruled in the part of nuclear arch-rivals India and Pakistan who have fought two of their three wars over control of Himalayan territory. And that is all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with the visuals of marigold blooming of the celebrations of the Day of the Dead. Thank you for watching us. Stay safe and have a good night.